What's up, folks? Charlie McKenzie here with another edition of Crop Talk Podcast. We are going to talk with someone that knows quick turn crops, microgreens, and uh, food production well, and that's Nick Greens. He's with Doman Company Foundation now, and uh, he's been in the business for quite a long time, uh, working with growers all over the country to help them get better at uh, growing microgreens and, and quick turn crops. So without further ado, Nick, how are you doing today, man? I'm doing great. How are you doing, Charles? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. I'm excited to have you on um, and to talk about, you know, understanding the intricacies of quick turn crop production. And and just to give the listeners a little bit of background, quick turn crops would be something like baby leafy greens, even even leafy greens, you know, all the way up to like lettuce, but especially things that are that are turning from the time they're germinated to the time they're harvested, you know, within 35 days or so. And um, Nick has specialized a lot in that. So that's what we're hitting on today. But before we get into that, Nick, could you spend a little bit of time sharing more about yourself and kind of your past and what you're up to these days at Doman Company Foundation? Yeah, yeah, I can. Um, So I started off in about 2002 uh, in the cannabis industry, uh, working at a a hydroponics store. Uh, You know, and from there, I um, got introduced to a bunch of growers in California. So I kind of went to the route of volunteering for all these growers and and getting all the expertise from the guys that were doing it for years. Um, That's how I started off my career. Um, And then in 2010, I moved out uh, back to Chicago, where I'm originally from, and I got involved with a project called The Plant. Uh, It was in the back of the yards, and I was a full-time volunteer there for quite some time. Um, After that, um, I was hired by the non-for-profit uh, the non for profit took me on. I started a company called Nick Greens. It was just going to be a garden club to end up turning into a business, a very successful microgreen business that I was delivering on my bikes to all the Michelin star restaurants. Mm. Uh, then from there, I uh, went into, uh, got hired by Farmed Here. Farmed Here was the largest indoor um, vertical farm in 2014 in our nation. Um, I helped build the microgreen program there uh, that was servicing. Uh, over 42 Whole food stores, along with uh, about 50 other grocery stores. So that's where I got a lot of my uh, expertise and hands-on and, and, and really knowing how to do large-scale production. From there, I just started doing consulting, uh, consulting a lot of the bigger farms, and just kept doing that. And then now in 2019, I got hired by Doman Company Foundation, which is an awesome foundation, uh, Charlie. This company uh, was originally a pharmaceutical business uh, for, for 160 years. And now um, they convinced uh, the shareholders to give up the shares to the foundation so we could uh, uh, go on with the mission. And uh, the mission is to build a vertical farm here in Milwaukee and um, and create local jobs here. Right on. Yeah, that's, I, I do like the sound of that, man. That's huge. Um, local food and, and local jobs are, are massive opportunities. And, and um, it sounds like your expertise in quick turn crops are, are going to be helpful uh, in building out that vertical farm. So I'm excited to hear more about that as time goes on and, and see where that goes. So when we're getting down into the topic of you know, these quick turn crops. Could you share a little bit about, you know, from your point of view, what one of those crops is or, or some of those crops are and, you know, kind of some examples of, of how you've grown them in the past and what that kind of cultivation strategy kind of looks like? All right. So the, the, we'll start off with the first and uh, simplest one. It, it, it's radish. Uh, radish, the uh, turnaround time is anywhere from, I see people do it in five days to 10 days. And that all depends on their environment and and how cold it is and, and, you know, what season it is. Uh, um, So yeah, that's, that's one of the quickest turnaround ones. And, and, you know, with my experience, uh, it's not only the ones that are in light as well. There's crops that you can grow completely in the dark with no light. Uh, There's the popcorn shoots where they're completely always in the dark. Um, If you put them in the light, the textures on the on the popcorn shoots would get too uh, hard to chew, fibrous, um, and and you wouldn't be able to eat. They wouldn't be edible. So you have to grow these in the dark. And and so not all of them are grown with light. And I kind of like that. So there's other ones they're working on too. Pea shoots, uh, radish is also grown in the dark just to keep that nice purple when it's a purple radish. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So, you know, 
And then, you know, you can do sunflower shoots, you can do pea shoots, you can do all the brassicas, arugula. I mean, there's just all of these different, and then you get into the more ones that take a little bit longer, like your cilantro and, and, and your celery, uh, just because the germination time on that takes a long time. No, oh, that's cool. So, so you're talking about a lot of different colors and a lot of different flavors there, where it sounds like these are types of, of crops that, you know, traditionally would be used in, in culinary dishes. Is that correct? Correct. Correct. It all started off with, uh, with your Michelin star restaurants using this as garnishes uh, to enhance the plates. And then, uh, you know, somewhere in the, the 2000, uh, early 2000 to the late 2000, it just started really uh, taking it into the homes. And, and now you got your Michelin star restaurants really pulling back from using microgreens just because, you know, they're working on other things to uh, impress people with. Interesting. Very interesting. Yeah. Staying in the know on that's important for these growers to, to be able to navigate what they should be growing and how they should be growing it and, and, uh, diversify sometimes. So sounds like some of them could be growing in the dark, like you just uh, described, which is, which is pretty cool. Um, it's a, uh, in that sense, it's an atypical production strategy, which kind of leads me to my next question. Um, you know, when you're, when you're talking about getting a crop, in and out in such a short amount of time, there, there are probably some interesting and unique challenges that you face. What, what are a couple of those challenges you face with, you know, such a short crop time? Uh, and, you know, one of the biggest problems that, uh, that I occurred being a consultant in this, in this arena with short crops is overwatering. Mm. Um, you know, people never knew that they can overwater plants and, I can walk into a grow room, Charlie, and, and just know by smelling the grow room. Um, I'm pretty sure you walked into right. some grow rooms and just smelled that, you know, the funk. Yep. <laughs> and, and, and when the funk is there, you know, something is up. So, mm-hmm. you know, and, and everybody thought I was crazy doing this. And, and then I started to teach people more about overwatering and even underwatering as well. So there's that fine line of, of feeding your crops the right amount of, of water, of nutrient water. And just to make sure that you're dialed that in and that, and that all varies depending on your, your, your environment. And we know there's so many variables when it comes to environment. So there's really not one thing that I can say to help people, uh, but just to, just to make sure that uh, it, you dial it in correctly and just make sure you don't overwater. And I think that's the most important uh, advice that I can give. Oh, nice. Well, I'm sure the listeners appreciate that advice. What is another piece of advice that would would have been helpful for, you know, yourself, a young Nick to have at the start of their, uh, at the start of your career? You know, what, what would have been something other than that, that would have been nice for you to understand about these quick turn crops? And not to be hard headed. <laughs> okay. Uh, and to, and to actually uh, uh, ask for help. And, and to seek out uh, the experts and things that I wasn't good at. I, mm. I'm really not a finance person. I did end up partnering up with a, a CFO uh, later on, uh, but I wasn't actually running the farms no more when I teamed up with the CFO. So I wish when I was actually running the farms and actually producing the crops, um, then I wish I would have teamed up with a, a sub finance guy because I really think uh, the finance side is just as more most important than than the growing side. So to, to really seek out uh, a somebody that's that financial expert or or investor that has that background is definitely definitely something I wish I would have knew uh, in the early on of, of, of the stages of my career. So do you think it's, it's both from a perspective of being able to fund the operation as well as just like the, the daily and monthly business operation, having that person there to, to help you with cash flow and numbers and things like that? Is it all of those combined that makes a CFO valuable? Correct. Correct. Yes. Yes. And, and yes, definitely have to have the money coming. And if you don't have that money, uh, you're always tending to seek money. And it's not a really good because then you're just really bootstrapping it all the time. And I mean, it's fine to bootstrap it in the early seed stage, but when you leave that seed stage, you got to get off the bootstrap and and really run a business. So, yeah, yeah. so well, good, good advice think, there. 
Yeah. So with, with quick turn crops, it seems to me that one of the challenges that someone could run into would be, um, production planning, you know, their, their crops are in and out very quickly. You're seeding them and, and then all of a sudden you turn around and harvesting, harvesting them into, to make the best use out of your space. You want to backfill with another crop quickly. So I'm interested to hear from you, you know, what have you done in your careers in growing quick turn crops to kind of fine tune that production planning aspect of it? Well, when I started off the Nick Greens, um, I had a, I had a partner help me. We we were both volunteers at the plant when we started off. Uh, His name was David Skoog. Uh, David Skoog was just a very awesome man uh, when it came to crop planning and helping me out on that department. Me, I really, really dived into knowing the plants and really getting to know the plants. And along with uh, um, having David along, it helped us both work together and work that crop plan out. So once again, I didn't try to do that part myself. I'm glad that I had somebody help me with the crop planting part. Um, And that's what really, really made a successful farm is having that uh, somebody there that's actually running you know, making the calls to the, to the, making the sales, letting me know when I need to have them on the day I need to have these on. And then with us together, we could work out the crop plan. Cause I knew how long the crop would take. Um, it's just a matter of having somebody there and helping you uh, work that out. Absolutely. I mean, they could do it themselves. Just, you just gotta be really good at spreadsheets and, and just, and just timing. And yeah, consistency is very, very important in this game, Charlie. And I, and I think you understand that. Absolutely. So, so I, I, uh, ascertained that you guys were using something like Excel spreadsheets to kind of map it all out and, and do your, you know, your crop times and when you planted it and when you expect to harvest that type of thing. Correct. Correct. And then we had also a menu of, uh, of whatever was ready. I, I provided a menu of things that were ready and he was the one that, that sent it out uh, as a, as we, we called an availability list. Okay. Um, so when you're working with restaurants, uh, you got to deal restaurants what they're used to. Uh, and if you can hand over an availability list twice a week to restaurants, uh, you're in business. So it sounds like having, having, um, the ability to test a lot of different varieties, both from a, a production standpoint, and then also like a, a consumer standpoint, one, you want to understand how quickly you can produce them and if they're, they're profitable in terms of their yield and things like that, but also are, are the chefs and customers willing to accept them? Um, so it sounds like you're, you're constantly in that type of business, you're constantly doing testing on different varieties and flavors and colors, I would assume. Yes, yes. Um, when you're running a microgreen business, you got to always have an R and uh, uh, D going on, and not even just for for the colors and the timing, but also for uh, what happens is when you're buying a lot of seeds, you tend to the, the 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 lot numbers change. So, say for instance, I bought seeds from Johnny Select, and they gave me a lot number. Well, that lot number was already dying down. They sent me in some new seeds. I wouldn't buy a bulk of seeds. I would buy a pound of the new lot number, run a test to make sure that germination rate was on point, and then buy the bulk. So I learned on how to always run my R&D to buying seeds too, because you don't want to buy two tons of seeds that the germination's not good. (laughs) Oof. <laughs> that's some real good advice there. Yeah, no, that is good advice. I mean, I, yeah, that's something that um, without the experience of doing it, you don't really know that that could happen to you. So so having an R&D at, at always going on is very, very important. So that, that definitely, I've always been in an R&D mode until this day. I'm still doing research and development as we speak. Uh, that's awesome. What would you say that something something that you're um, currently interested in because it's kind of picking up in the in the Michelin star restaurant scene? What's something kind of hot off the press in your mind? Uh, uh, doing mini vegetables and and mm. edible flowers are are you know the blossoms with attached to the little mini vegetable and stuff. Um, that that's been hot for quite some time just to be able to provide them locally. Um, there's, right. there's two, there's two major players in the game that are, that are really, really running that uh, industry and that's fresh origin. And then uh, uh, you got chef's garden. Uh, them are the two that are really, really running the, the, 
the fancy little things that, that the chefs just go crazy for, but they're very expensive and they're shipping them from all over. They're shipping them from California and Ohio to all over the world. Oh, okay. So there stands to be some local fresh production of that, uh, as a, as a market for sure. Correct. Very niche market, but it's there. Yes. Oh, I like that. No, thanks for the scoop there, man. That's, that's very cool. Um, so a transition and out of, out of quick turn crops and into a little bit more about Nick, what, who is someone that you are currently grateful for in your life or, or business and why are you grateful for them? It would be, Steve Denenberg. Uh, Steve Denenberg was the, one of the founders at Farmed Here. Um, I met him through another mutual friend uh, when I got to work at Farmed Here. And uh, when he left Farmed Here, I asked him to come on board with Nick Green's grow team and help me out with that. Uh, he is a CFO and he's a finance guy. And, and that I'm very, very grateful that I partnered up with him because I would not be where I'm at if it wasn't having that solid uh, finance guy on the side uh, telling me not to do things when I thought I should have <laughs> <laughs> or, or to go full tilt into something because it's working. Yeah. I'm, I'm, Cor- I'm with you. Yeah. Yes. No, that's, that's invaluable. The business side of it, I think is horticulturalist and folks that are you know tied to the plants. Sometimes it, yeah, you can have rose colored glasses on when it comes to, it comes to some of the finances. So I can understand why you're grateful for, for someone like that. And I am, uh, just as much in the, in the same position as you when it comes to, um, being thankful for the money guys, whether they can bring some funding or help me manage mine better. So I understand, man, if a listener that was listening to this podcast was like, man, I want to talk to Nick more about quick turn crops. I want to talk to him about microgreens, baby vegetables, you know, uh, these, these new flower blossoms, um, that are kind of hitting hard and have some opportunity or just want to talk about the non-for-profit work that you've done. How would someone get a hold of you? I'm running a Facebook group right now. It's called, uh, microgreens group. Okay. And in that Facebook, we already got a thousand members on that Facebook. And about a, about three weeks ago, I launched what they call the mentorship program. And what this mentorship program allows is anybody can sign up to the mentorship program and they would have one-on-one mentorship with me. Um, I am the only mentor on there right now, but I'm encouraging other mentors to come on board and help me out too. I got about uh, already 10 mentees that I'm mentoring for a little while now. And, um, that's how I, I don't have too much time to answer. I answer every morning, early in the morning, I'll answer all the questions and then I have to get on with my day. Uh, but I try to at least, uh, hit them questions once, once, uh, once a day and, uh, try to guide some of these, uh, you know, all types of questions I get, you know, I even asked the per- somebody even asked me if I can see their business plan. Uh, that's not what the mentorship's about. That's, a, that's called a consulting gig. So I don't look at business plans but I'll answer questions and talk about shop all day. Right on. No, that's a valuable resource. Definitely hit him up on that Facebook group. I know uh, Nick likes to share information and help folks kind of grasp uh, what they're trying to get into and help them troubleshoot things. And then if you want to go deeper, try to see if you can get some of his time on some consulting work and also be looking out for some of the content that Nick produces. He's definitely on social as well. Uh, check out what he's doing there. Uh, Nick, hey man, I appreciate your time here on the podcast and uh, the information and insights you shared with myself and the listeners. Thank you for having me and, um, and keep up the good work. This is, this is some awesome uh, work you're doing here and, and, uh, and I'm honored that uh, you had me as a guest.